Welcome to episode number 77 of the Balancing Act podcast. I'm Andy Tempty. Today we've got Dan Flynn joining us as our second guest in our mini series on the importance of building the skill of decision making in individuals and in teams. Dan is Chief Revenue Officer at Barnum Financial Group and has held recruiting and learning positions at major financial services firms such as Prudential, Mass Mutual, and MetLife. Thanks for sharing your talents and insights with us today, Dan. Yeah, great to be here, Andy. Thanks so much for the invite. So, uh, seeing as you are a registered agent with an investment firm, we have a bit of fun housekeeping to do with a mandatory disclosure. Ready, everybody? All opinions expressed by Dan Flynn and Andrew Tempty are solely their current opinions and do not reflect the opinions of their respective parent companies or affiliates or the companies with which Dan Flynn and Andrew Tempty are affiliated. I think you have a, uh, we'll be seeing you next year and uh, doing some voiceover work. Oh, uh, it, it, it would be so much fun uh, to be a character in an animated feature, you know, that, <laughs> For sure. that, that would just be the... Uh, I, I would have died and gone to heaven. That's great. So, Dan, uh, as we always do, uh, before we get started, uh, it'd be great if you told our listeners your story. Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, it's incredible reflecting that I'm coming up on 30 years in um, in financial services. So being in the same industry my whole career and really reflecting back on just it's an, unbelievable how much change, you know, think about the business and how it's done and who does it and um, all of the different external influences. It's just been um, incredible. And I've been blessed uh, in terms of my career. I know we'll talk about this a little bit, but just the um, um, different uh, models and companies I've had exposure to um, and but also the the amount of change. And and um, I always think of my leadership of the uh, uh, calm seas do not a skilled mariner make, right? It's been some, you know, some craziness along the way with uh, a couple of um, acquisitions and relocations and, and all of those being incredible opportunities. We talk a lot of, at Barnum about having a growth mindset, you know, and I know being around you, that kind of lifelong learner and now really being able to reflect back on 30 years ago, man, I'm grateful for a lot of those, not necessarily in the moment per se, but, but really having that um, ability to learn from all of those uh, experiences, both in terms of as a leader, but also strategically, right? We're going to talk about decision-making, um, you know, seeing a lot of that change and, and what went well, what didn't, but, but again, I'm, I'm blessed as you described, I've really always been in a space of, working with financial advisors. That's my passion and energy and love. Um, I feel like that's my way to have an impact is, you know, through them being able to have an impact um, with communities. Again, I know we'll talk about the profession, but but that's really my story has kind of been this journey, um, certainly in, you know, like to be um, seen as an expert in my field, but as I've matured, it's really about being a leader and leading strategic initiatives is really how, um, how I played. And, you know, again, 30 years in, um, I look forward, I've never been more excited in my career. It's just such an awesome time to be in this business. I'm excited about my new opportunity as you and I talked about. And so, uh, just really enthusiastic about what the future looks like. Uh, that that's great, Dan. Um, you know the the world of wealth management needs uh, many more Dan Flynn's uh, leading the charge. Uh, but if you had to pick one event in your life that just put rocket boosters uh, behind your career, what would that event be? Yeah, I think back. I um, you know, you have those inflection points, and for me, it was. Um, I was part, there's again, a lot of change happening, right? To me, that's for people listening. When there's change going on, it can feel uneasy, but but that's where the opportunities are. And uh, I remember I had a, um, a leader was sharing with me, we, you know, we're kind of bringing companies and groups together and things like that. And he was sharing with me like, hey, here's here's the path we're heading down and here's where I'm seeing you. And, you know, I'm sure he read my body language that, you know, I wasn't as enthusiastic as maybe he thought. And he created a little bit of space. And I'm like, you know, I'm excited about where we're going, 
But I was declarative that I'm like, I see myself where I can have a bigger impact doing this versus that. And, um, um, you know, it, it just was instinctual at the time. And I give a lot of credit to him in, in terms of having trust. I had trust and he, you know, had built that early where I could kind of have a voice. Um, and, um, and I was declarative. And, and from that moment, it really, you know, I, I got, it's got an opportunity and, and, um, um, it went really well for me and it led to other opportunities, right? It was just kind of that, as you described that catalytic moment for my career, um, and as I reflect on that, it's, you know, I, I, it's a good, these are always good for reminders, right? It's a great reminder for me that, you know, as a leader, I've got to create space for those kind of conversations and frankly, push people pushing back on my perspective, but also, you know, trying to find as much as possible, the intersection of the business opportunity and the work that needs to get done with what people are passionate about and where they want to take their career. When you can make those connections, uh, you know, my experience is you're going to get a better outcome. Right. And so just, you know, again, having that be part of the process is, uh, is something I took away from that experience and certainly is have a lot of gratitude towards that leader for giving me an opportunity in that moment. Yeah. So as we're, we're slowly but surely marching up to our 100th episode. And when we get there, we're going to, we, we've asked this particular question of all of our guests, and we're going to break down the proportion uh, that uh, of their life changing experiences and what buckets they fit into. Uh, and, you know, that uh, that change bucket uh, is has been a significant driver for many of our guests uh, careers. So I, I expect that, uh, you know, periods of great change where one kind of leaned in to the change like you did uh, is that that's going to be at or near the top of the of the list right. of real of career drivers. Yeah, I can see that. Right. I mean, again, it's it's. And for me, I go back to um, my opening comments of my story where I've had those moments I've been able to observe, hey, right, I, I've I've now have the benefit of seeing that in the long run, they're really good, right? But again, when they're happening, they're scary. And so it's having some of that, whatever it is, you know, courage, resilience, leaning on others during those times, right? It really does create the biggest opportunity. If you can quick, the quicker you can move yourself into the, you know, positive and proactive mindset, you know, the more you can capitalize on it. Yeah, so we, we've got a nice uh, double bonus episode. You know, we did a whole mini series on change and change management uh, in the summer of 2022. And uh, this, uh, so we're, we're going to shift gears now into decision making, but we got an, an extra little uh, lesson on uh, the power of the power of change. Uh, so let's dive into the topic at hand, which is decision making. Can you help our listeners understand the process that you go through when faced with making a challenging, multifaceted organizational decision? Yeah, so I think the the you know a couple of um, foundational thoughts on this, right? I think it's really as a leader and as a you know anyone in business, it's you've got to recognize that each decision needs to be approached a little bit differently, you know. And as I think about this, Andy, I think honestly about and it's way broader than decision making. But, you know, I think about your book of balancing act, right? To me, this decision making is all about finding the right balance of different things in each situation. So, you know, a couple of examples of that is you hear, we need to be faster decision making, right? Well, is it does that mean you stop being thoughtful? No, right? It's finding the right balance of those two things. You hear, you know, how many leaders or successful people talk about trust your instinct? Does that mean you throw out data decision, uh, you know, data driven decision making? No, it's you got to find the balance of those two things. So I think as you, you know, again, anyone, whether it's a CEO or someone just, you know, running a small team or individual, right? Like, thinking about, do I have the right balance here? And to me, that's what, you know, having a structured process is about. So, for me, it's really taking these couple of um, key steps. And interestingly, you know, we're in a financial planning business. I always share it's it's I think of um, decision making or strategy almost in the kind of um, uh, process of financial planning. 
and working with clients. It's number one, and, and the most important step is, do we have alignment and clarity on what our objective is? I, I can't tell you how many times, and I've certainly been guilty of this, of, you know, you start jamming on something and then all of a sudden you're getting to step three, four, and five, and it's like, oh, wait, we're not even aligned on what we're trying to accomplish here, right? It's like, okay, start over. Um, so really, if I would say taking time, make sure there, and, and constantly reminding, right? Having that playback. It's like, hey, just so that we're clear, are we checking that the objective here is this, right? Having that be part of the muscle memory so that, you know, you're really thinking about, you know, that clarity and alignment. Then step two for me is always going into that discovery process, whether that's talking to people, I'm doing that. My started a new job, six or new firm, new role 60 days ago, I'm coming up on that conclusion, right? And now I'm okay. The data, the conversations, um, and now starting to formulate, what are some options? You know, what are some paths forward? And I always like to suggest if you're going to go and influence and there's stakeholders involved, go to the table with some options that you're happy with either outcome, right? If it's, yeah. if it's like, Hey, it's my way or the highway and here's the decision. And then, you know, especially in, in larger organizations, you know, you, you might be disappointed um, when it's kind of yes or no versus which one do you like? I, I like that approach. So developing some options that all, and having obviously, you know, the pros and cons, and then, you know, clearly it's executing. How are you going to execute this? You know, and you got to kind of know that. I mean, you have to execute it, obviously, to be successful. You got to kind of know an execution path as you're formulating the solutions. Um, and then the last thing for me that, you know, this takes a while to kind of learn and it's and it's hard. It's probably the hardest piece is creating room and having structure, frankly, to go back to those decisions, um, and really reflect on did things work or not, right? And to me, there's really two pieces of that of, um, number one, are you going to be agile and check and adjust, right? I think, you know, you make a decision, the chance that you get it perfectly and then you could just never think about it again is quite rare in my experience. You better be kind of checking in and going, oh, do we get that right and make adjustments as you go? But I think the other thing is, are people learning from the decisions they've made? or they just on to the next one, it's a clean slate, or you catch being intentional with the learning and, and then being able to reflect. And um, I remember a speaker was part of like the Blue Angels, I think, and they had like, I forget what they called it, right? Like the debrief right after. It's like, how did that go? And, and so really having the debrief to say, what did we learn? So you keep getting better each time you're making decisions. I think that's a piece that gets lost quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I, uh, as, as a continuous improvement guy, you know, you, you really hit on plan, do check act, uh, PDCA, uh, in, in your, in your yeah, uh, response could, there. One last suggestion. And again, I know we're, we're decision-making, right. But I, you know, we've connected in kind of the learning path. I, one of the yeah. things that, um, I remember going through, we, we, I was at a firm, we were acquired, and my team, we were in kind of this mode of, um, you know, not able to control a lot, right? And one of the things that, and then we had to do it again. And we we're like, okay, what did we learn the first time? And it's don't lose the learning in the pain. And and so to me, that what that translates to is find someone or a small group of people that are also growth minded and open to learning. And really be intentional about what you're observing and what you're experiencing. I mean, you're going to go through it anyway, right? And you're going to learn from it, of course, right? We always talk about you're going to learn from your experiences. In my experience, if you do that with someone else and you're intentional about what are we learning, you're going to, a lot more is going to sink in and, and uh, you're going to get more value out of it. To dig a little bit deeper, Dan, uh, can you recount a decision-making experience that didn't go as planned, uh, led to a poor result? And, you know, we've been talking about learning. Uh, what was the missing ingredient that could have led to a better decision? Yeah, um, so, you know, I've got a number of these, right? But but I thought in the spirit of uh, lightning things and also it was easy is I actually um, had one, I think on Friday it was. So I'm like, okay, let's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in this moment. It's not a, a big, you know, it's not a big issue or anything, but I was thinking about this in terms of, 
you know, what are some of the learnings? And um, so as I, as you know, and as I shared, right, I'm at a new firm, I've got a new team, and I'm, I am excited beyond belief. It's a smaller firm. So the ability to be nimble and act quickly is certainly one of the key things that was appealing. And so, you know, I see a lot of, there's a incredible opportunity. And so we're making some adjustments with our team. Um, and so it's, it's moving way faster than I've ever experienced. And I got overly excited about that. And I think, um, didn't, wasn't thoughtful enough about how to communicate things in a thoughtful way, right? Went back to my earlier, you know, point. And so, um, you know, I think I missed an opportunity to say, okay, what's the impact of that? You know, easy enough to take ownership and say, okay, I learned from this, but, you know, something that I was overly excited about and was a very positive, right, for all involved by, shortcutting the communication by trying to, you know, be too expeditious back to my point earlier is a missed opportunity. It was a missed opportunity for alignment. It was a missed opportunity for engagement. Um, and, um, and I think the lesson that I, as I reflected on that, uh, number one, let me say this. I am so grateful. Someone gave me the feedback and, and that is an incredible gift, right? As a leader. And I shared this with a person like, there's nothing worse than having blind spots, right? And someone's not telling you, hey, you got something in your teeth, right? It's like, so as a leader, <laughs> my whole goal would be to create a culture where that's the environment with each other and certainly with me, right? So that that was a positive that I'm like, this is great and I want to reinforce that. Um, so that that was a gift. But what I, you know, to me, when you're making the decision making, uh, especially, you know, in the in any organization, but large organizations, things are moving fast. The people and how the people are going to react and respond and who's affected can easily get lost. Right. And so to me, that's why this is a really good one to share. I'm going through it right now. It's not detrimental in any way. Right. But, but you certainly could have that where all good intentions get lost because not enough time and energy is given into all right, who's affected by this and how do we care for them? And by the way, we all, you and I know we, at our firm, we use Colby quite a bit. I've used other, you know, tools. People process change differently, right? And, and are affected differently. And so me being kind of my, you know, in Colby terms, quick start where I'm ready to move and others need more time, right? And so uh, that was a, a, you know, a good reminder for me, I'd say that, really in decision making thinking about the people and then making sure you have a doesn't mean you have to slow everything down but having a plan to kind of care for um who's affected and and how they're going to um process it right and making sure to get communication right yeah uh, there's i can't tell you how many times um that i've gone okay standing out front we're going this way <laughs> And then I look around and there and everybody's kind of wandering around because there wasn't that alignment. There wasn't, uh, you know, that that connection and that understanding uh, and the acceptance, uh, the, the, the change. Uh, every, everybody's got their own change management curves uh, for lots of different situations. So uh, th thank you for really bringing change management in. Uh, is there a former mentor, uh, former boss or colleague that in your opinion just had outstanding decision making skills and what really set them apart? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've certainly been um, fortunate to be, you know, have learned from so many people. Right. And to your point, it's not just leaders, but colleagues, people on my team um, and really being able to be in that mode to observe. Um, but as I reflect on this, there is one that stands out, I think partly because of the point I was at in my career. Uh, and I think that's important for leaders to understand and recognize, right? People that are at certain inflection points, maybe it's like, hey, they're a manager for the first time, or, you know, they just got a new role that's, you know, more elevated, whatever it might be. I think it's, people in those stages are more apt to kind of look around and observe perhaps. Um, and so, um, you know, I just thought of that as I was reflecting on, all right, why did this stand out is, Hey, I'm, I was, um, you know, ripe for exposure. Right. And so, uh, when I think back on this leader to your question, what really stood out was, um, you know, that person 
um, not having conviction and, and really taking emotion out of the decisions, right? Being really, again, that balance of, you know, having the right input, data, trusting instincts, but you know, when this person was making and conveying a decision, there was a ton of conviction around it. And I think the most important part of that, Andy, was especially, again, as you and I operated in larger corporate environments and structure, this especially stood out that this person was not at all concerned about being unpopular or pleasing everyone around the table, right? It was, this was the right decision. Here's why. And I get it. Some of you might not be happy with it, right? And I don't really concern myself with how this might reflect at the end of the year when everybody's doing reviews and bonuses, right? It was making the right decision for the business and kind of taking the people and, and themselves, probably most importantly, um, out of the equation. And, and to me, that that really stood out, especially at that point in time. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break uh, for a, a commercial message and we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the Balancing Act podcast. I'm Andrew Tempty. In my book, Balancing Act, Teach, Coach, Mentor, Inspire, I explore the characteristics required of leaders who must find balance between strength and vulnerability, confidence and selflessness, passion and measure, and leadership and followership. Balancing Act is available today at Amazon.com. And we're back with Dan Flynn talking about decision-making in the workplace. Uh, let's run a really quick thought experiment. Uh, suppose you have an early career manager in front of you right now who struggles to be decisive and is not confident in, in their decision-making skills. What advice do you have for them? You know, um, I think interesting kind of goes back to the, the leader I just you know, shared, right? And that was observing that that conviction that that they possessed. And so I think about this, it's a lot of times that lack of conviction or confidence or decisiveness, as you said, can come from a place of insecurity. And so really examining, to me, that's a key part of being a leader and a good decision maker is, you know, being very introspective and reflective. And so I think in this scenario, it's, you know, okay, do I have insecurity about either the decision I'm making or just decision making overall? And then are those real or perceived, right? Because a lot of times it could be both. And so when I think about breaking it down to, to each of those areas, you know, is it a real perceived insecurity? Meaning, like to me, the fundamental, you have, and this is the biggest compliment people have paid me in my career, you know, in terms of, um, being a, um, a decision maker or expert is, you know, your stuff, right? There, there's really no substitute for doing the hard work and, you know, researching, getting, you know, talking to people, uh, uh, getting through the data. And really, to me, that, you know, doing that work and having the preparation and following the process we talked about earlier, that, to, at least for me, gives me a lot of conviction, right? I feel like, you know, because, let's just say absent that, and I've seen this and I've been there, where you then go bring the decision or the recommendation to the table. Um, and when you're challenged, and you will be, right, uh, um, on, on many decisions, um, that's going to get exposed, right? You and, and so to me, that's a key part of it. There's no substitute to that of, um, you know, being a student of the industry, metrics, all those pieces, right? Uh, but I do think there's also an aspect, again, of that perceived. I, I Some of the, you know, and I, I do believe it's different people, right? Some are, have just incredible confidence and they probably have too much and need more of the competence, right? But some people that are incredibly competent, great decision makers that just, you know, don't have as much of that conviction, um, you know, I think it's finding the solution to that too, right? Is it, you know, Maybe every time you make a good decision, make sure you're super intentional to celebrate that. Maybe it's finding a mentor who can reinforce you. You know, even just think about affirmations, right? There's there's a lot of tools out there to help you build your confidence um, and reinforce, you know, the the value and and um, and qualities that you bring into your decision making process. And I think when you do that over time, you know, that's going to help someone show up with a lot more conviction about, you know, delivering that message and, and making the decision and then, and then delivering it. 
And, yeah, and one other thing, Andy, too, I'll give a yeah. little, you know, I was thinking about this in the context of there's also the perceive for yourself, but others, right? I think of like things like designations or, you know, indus- industry exposure, right? That was another thought around this of, all right, if you're showing up and and people know you as an expert, right? That's going to be a big deal in terms of having both yourself having that conviction, but others acknowledging it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Send, uh, both sending those signals. Uh, but I, what I loved about what you said is, you know, having that mentor, because as we grow in our careers, uh, as we move up the ladder, there are fewer and fewer people uh, that uh, that are around us that we can confide in uh, and who are going to help us uh, celebrate uh, good, uh, you know, the good decisions that that we make. So, you know, having somebody to talk to, uh, you know, because as 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 the boss, uh, there are you're you're patting uh, other people on the back, uh, you know, uh, urging them on. And uh, as a leader, it can get uh, it can get fairly lonely. So having having that mentor uh, to bounce things off of, I think, is is really important. Absolutely. Yeah. Critical. And I think some and I'll speak for myself as you know, when you some people look to go, hey, I need to go. I need a mentor. Right. But I don't know who to ask or, hey. Andy would be a great mentor, but he's so busy. I don't want to. And and at least for me, and I know other leaders, you know, I think that's a perception out there that, oh, they're too busy. Right. I, to me, as a, and I know you feel the same way, right? It's like, as a leader, like, that's your number one job, right? I told some of these stories of people, I would not be sitting in my seat if others didn't do the same. And I couldn't have conviction around decision making or much else, right? If I didn't, um, you know, wasn't receptive to someone who, it asked for help. I think the key thing I always tell people is if you're going to ask for a mentor, you better get yourself in the mindset that you're going to do the work, right? If, if you show up and go help me with this and then, you know, there's, you don't see anyone kind of putting in the effort around it. Uh, to me, that's where, you know, some of those things fall apart. Yeah. So you and I uh, have been in the learning space. I love to talk about skills on this show. Uh, You were the head of learning and recruiting for several major uh, global corporations. Can you name two skills that our listeners should hone to become better decision makers? Yeah, I think think the first one just jumps right out to me is um, really being a, a good active listener. You know, again, it kind of goes back to what I shared earlier, where these go sideways and and really being open minded, you know, having your own strong kind of perspective and conviction, right, and point of view for sure, but then going into the decision making process, open minded and actively listening, right? and especially to people that have different perspectives than you. I think that's I know I think we'll talk about this a little a little bit in terms of diversity, but I think that's where, you know, diversity maybe gets lost a little bit in terms of the the importance is in decision making. Right. I've got right. to have different perspectives. I just got off with, you know, I'm meeting advisors at our firm and, you know, the, the guy I was just talking to is in his fourth year. and He's like, I'm not sure I can help you. Right. And you got way successful people. I'm like, I need your perspective, right? I can't, you can't just go off of one audience or one part of the group. Um, And so to me, that's the, uh, you know, broader power of diversity. So really having those listening skills, and sometimes that's harder when you're sitting with someone and they think differently and act differently and, and maybe challenge you, right? So to me, that's, you know, one of the, one of the most crucial skills. And, And again, this is where, you know, leveraging some of those tools to understand the differences and and really be inquisitive there are really valuable. Um, I think the second one, I don't know, you can, I'm not really a learning professional as you and I met. I was kind of, you know, uh, I'm a, you know, sales and distribution leader who's had the great opportunity. And I use that as an example, right, of getting outside of my comfort zone and, and meeting yep. with you and others in, in other industries, right? Um, Because I think about that, and to me, the second piece of this, I don't know if it's a skill, so feel free to challenge me on this, but really being a, um, you know, student of your field and and being a, um, and I think getting out of your respective bubble, if you will, right? Whether that's 
you know, how many companies, right, are very insular and they don't know what's going on in their industry or, again, the opportunity where you and I met at um, at um, the advisory board where there were people from um, who were from other industries who had global perspective and, man, that was that valuable for me. And, and so to me, that's a key part of this, you know, again, I don't know if it's a skill necessarily, but having that ability and that and that focus to you know really know what's going on from a macro perspective trends well beyond kind of your world of of where this decision is being made i think that's a crucial one that most people you know get too busy for right i think uh in my experience yeah well that is a skill uh dan and we uh, we we just wrapped up our mini uh, an entire mini series on that skill of uh, uh, many call it business acumen, some call it commercial acumen. Uh, back uh, when I was running Kaplan uh, Kaplan Professional, uh, we had a behavior uh, that we we said be a student of the business. And, uh, you know, that that is absolutely a skill, taking those blinders off, being able to look left and right and up and down uh, and see the world ar- around you is uh, is absolutely, absolutely essential. Well, Dan, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, we've got one more uh, one more topic to hit here. Uh, you know, the wealth management industry generally, you know, we're talking about decision making today with the diversity of thought uh, and, and, and opinion. Uh, the wealth management industry is, and the statistics, uh, you know, this, these are objective statistics is dominated by white males. <laughs> and we were talking before about, you know, the benefits of having a, a diversity of thought, opinion, people who don't look and talk uh, and, and think the same way that you do. So, uh, you know, we, we're talking about the changes that are needed in the, both the education landscape and recruiting practices to diversify the field of wealth management. What advice do you have for wealth management leaders and recruiters to move the needle on industry diversity? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this you kind of get strike a nerve. I love our industry. I'm passionate about it. This is the thing that frustrates me the most, right? And I've been in multiple organizations and been at the forefront of saying, hey, we got to fix this for now 30 years, right? And and certainly there's been progress. I do not want to discount yeah. that, but uh, we we have a lot of work to do to um, remain relevant to our respective audiences and stakeholders, whether that's clients or, or talent and, and broader than that. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the I, I think the the key thing in all of this is that all of the leaders and the companies and anyone, you know, who's got a seat at the table to recognize the business imperative of this. Right. And I think, again, you know, we'll talk about this of like, you know, the face of America and serving the face of America. We talk a lot about that in financial services organizations and and the changing demographics and needing to um, and needing to, um, you know, better represent our communities. And and that's crucial to have talent. Uh, But I do think there's there's another piece that that's, you know, equally important that we talked about earlier. We have you know, in financial services, you know, m- many industries, right? But there's big problems to solve. And you're not going to solve those big problems if you got all white guys sit around the table trying to solve them. It's just not going to be as good, yep. right? Whether it's, uh, and so to me, that's the critical part of this of we have got to recognize it's important because it's not going to be easy, right? And I feel like sometimes it's everybody's looking for the silver bullet. What's the initiative that's going to solve this? It is not. It is going to be take time. We can't take shortcuts. And, you know, to me, I, from at least my lens on it, there's really three key things that as an industry, as leaders, as companies, as individuals, we need to, to, to drive an impact. One is culture. You know, again, we talk, I know you talk about this all the time, the importance of culture are we creating inclusive cultures? Um, and, you know, it's a lot easier to do that when you have a clean slate, but we have, 
organizations locally and, and nationally that have, you know, these embedded cultures that have been perpetuated, not intentionally in many cases, right? People think of this as, oh, people wanting to do harm. No, it's just, it's what it is. And now changing it is hard work. So intentionally changing the culture to be more inclusive, number one, we certainly have stru structural obstacles, right, to, to barrier in this. Uh, and I think of just one we're working on actively right now is um, how we bring new people into this career, right? There's structural obstacles to, um, you know, to women, to people of color, socioeconomic barriers, right? We've got to take those walls down and make it more, um, uh, give people a better shot at success in this business. Um, and then the last one is uh, our messaging. You know, again, it kind of goes back to solving that problem, right? It's like when you have, what you know, male, white male dominated people trying to figure this out, the messaging is off, right? We need to change our messaging because I do believe there's, you know, when I look and spend time on this with next generation of talent and diverse talent, the things they're looking for are embedded in this, in this business, in this career. We're just off on how we're positioning it and making it about things that aren't relevant or important to them. So, you know, to me, that's the, from my seat and experience, those are the three, you know, ingredients, if you will. But again, I think fundamentally it's, you know, are we willing to invest resources and focus on this consistently over the long term and recognize that it's going to take time or do we not see the results and then somebody new in charge comes and got a new plan, right? It's, you got to, you got to chop the wood on this one. And I'm really, um, you know, passionate about that. And certainly uh, I'm excited about being able to influence and impact that in the organization I'm in, as well as in the industry. That's that's uh, great news, Dan. Uh, so thank you so much for being on the show today. It was a, it's been an absolute pleasure reconnecting with you. Uh, my name is Andy Tempty. This is the Balancing Act podcast. Uh, we, your guest today was Dan Flynn. Please find us on all the major podcast streaming services uh, where uh, the episode will be out on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, please like, subscribe, rate, share uh, to, you know, to bring the show to, uh, to, more, to more folks. So thank you so much. Andy, thank you so much. This has been a blast. It's been a great reconnecting with you. And um, if I could just share, I, I'm so excited about my new organization, Barnum Financial Group. Um, we talk about culture, right? That's that's so exciting. And so uh, I invite everyone to check, check us out at barnumfinancialgroup.com if that's okay. That is awesome. Thank you, Dan. Take care. All right. Take care, Andy.